again. This is Father Stephen from St. Aidan's in my office, which is also my sacristy. And as you know, we are doing different Mass parts, so trying to explain the Mass, the parts of the Mass, but also the things that we use in Mass. So if you remember last time I dressed up in the vestments, I spoke to you a little bit about the vestments. I pointed out the sink over there for making sure my hands are clean before Mass, not just after. I pointed out the relics over there. I also wanted to draw your attention to my bookshelf over here. So I have some 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 books, um, resource books. I have a lot of books. Some people say, oh, Father, did you read all those books? No. But I have looked into some of them, or, or most of them. Uh, but I also wanted to show you my beautiful statues. Uh, most of them were gifts to me. So this is actually St. Bernadette. I used to be at St. Bernadette's in Ajax. And this is St. Stephen, the first martyr. And of course, this is St. Michael, the Archangel. So today, I wanted to talk to you about the next important part of the Mass, and that pertains to the chalice. So traditionally, the priest would actually carry in the chalice when he was going to celebrate Mass. He would carry it in procession, at least at a low Mass. So a high Mass or a solemn sung Mass would have already been in place in the sanctuary. So the sanctuary is the area where the altar is. So as you can see, this is my personal chalice. It was a gift to me from my parents when I was ordained. And it's not a brand new chalice, but it's an old chalice that was used previously by priests who are now deceased. And I especially wanted a chalice that had been used in the past. I just felt it was, you know, a greater attachment or a greater connection to the celebration of the Mass. So chalices traditionally, and even now, should be with um, precious metals. So either plated silver or gold. So this is plated silver. And the metal that it's, it's on is not the best metal. It's a very soft metal so that they could do the beautiful kind of decorations on it. And if you see these medallions on there, so this is our Lord over here. I don't know if you could zoom in and, and see the image of our Lord. And notice there's a cross right above the image of our Lord. And that's very significant, okay? So as I turn the chalice, this is Our Lady, all right? And I turn the chalice a little bit more, and that is St. Joseph, okay? So three medallions, the Holy Family. The Right above our Lord, there is a cross. Now, traditionally on every chalice, there was a cross. So when the priest is celebrating the Mass, even the cross on the chalice has to be facing him, or rather, he is facing the cross. So everything about the Mass should remind the priest about the cross. Now, or the crucifixion, rather. Now, the, the pattern, this is called the pattern, this is what goes on top. Now, normally when we get the chalice ready, we put this purificator on there, like so, and we would put the pattern on top of there, and we would place the large host or the large altar bread that the priest uses on top of it. And I'm just going to do that for you now. So you get an idea of how the chalice is prepared for Mass. So that goes there. And on top of that, we put what's called a pall. And there are different types, different decorative ones. This is one of my own. I ordered it uh, not that long ago. Uh, some of the ladies are actually in the process of making some for me. Making some for me. Sometimes they get dirty. So sometimes they have a cloth on it that you can take off and, and clean. And on top of this, we would put the chalice veil. And I don't have the matching one right now, but let's just use this red one, even though it doesn't match. So the ideal is that it would match my vestments. Okay, so this is the chalice veil. And why do we use the chalice veil? Once again, that sense of mystery and awe. So because it's hidden from our sight, we cannot see it, it adds to the sense of mystery. This little container here is called a burse. I often think of it as a purse. That's an easy way to remember it. So it's a burse. And inside of it, we put the what's called the corporal. 
And the corporal is what the priest will lay out on the altar when he's going to celebrate Mass. So at the offertory, he will lay out the corporal like so. And if you remember when I was putting on the vestments, I would kiss each of the vestments, and some of the vestments actually have a cross on it. So also does the corporal. Once again, to remind us of the cross, to remind us of the crucifixion. And when you lay out the corporal, it's very important that you do it properly. You know, sometimes I've seen people who are assisting the priest and they kind of do this, they, they shake the corporal or they put it upside down. And it's not a good idea to do that because when the priest breaks the large host, little particles could fall onto the corporal. The word corporal in Latin means body. So this is where the body of Christ is going to become present. So after the Mass, when the priest folds this up, he has to do it very carefully so that any particles that are on there don't fall out. Okay, so there's actually a procedure as to how he folds it, and then he would put it inside the burst for safekeeping, and after some use, the usually the ladies of the church who clean the linens, they maintain the garden also, by the way, the flowers outside, the tulips are very beautiful, so thank you ladies for that. But they would purify these, um, these cloths, same as with, the, with the, um, the purificator that goes over the chalice. They need to be purified. And the word purified means that the holiness of it is, is removed so that we can use it again. So in other words, there might be some of the precious blood on the purificator. There might be some particles on the corporal. So the ladies, what they have to do is they have to soak it in a bowl of water. And then once it's soaked and uh, they pour the water onto the ground, not down the drain. In other words, it doesn't go to the same place where all of our sewer goes, but to treat it with greater respect. So they, they actually have to uh, soak the cloths three times in water and then pour it on the ground. So as I was speaking about my chalice, I mentioned that my parents gave it to me. And chalices are very expensive, partially because of their decoration, but also, also because they have the precious metal. Now this is just silver. Silver compared to gold is very cheap. So for example, what is it? An ounce of silver is like $1,000 on something, whereas an ounce of silver is like $36. So there's not a whole lot of silver because it's just silver plated, okay? This is more of a traditional style chalice. So as you can see, there's these what are called nodes. And these nodes actually help the priest. So in the old rite, once the priest consecrated the host, he had to keep his fingers together just in case there were any particles on his finger that they wouldn't fall. So when the priest went to consecrate the chalice, he would grab the chalice by the node while keeping his fingers united in that fashion. So having this node made it easier for the priest to pick up the chalice, to handle the chalice. The smaller node is when you're drinking. So when the priest drinks the precious blood, it's, it's very convenient to hold it from that position. And as you can see, you can still keep your fingers together. So in the Novus Ordo Mass, or the modern Mass, the priest doesn't have to keep his fingers together. Sometimes I do, you might notice, I do it just when I'm turning the page or, or something, but in general, I don't. So that was something pertaining to the Old Rite Mass. And I usually make sure there's no particles. But that was done so as to emphasize the, the reverence to even the slightest, tiniest particle, because that is truly our Lord. If we can sense it, if we can see it or feel it, it means our Lord is present there. I also wanted to speak to you about the Saboria. So these are the Saboria that we use here at St. Aidan's. As you can see, they are flat, or, or kind of as opposed to the chalice, which is more upright. We do have Saboria that are similar to the shape of the chalice, and they would have a lid. So both the Saboria having a lid as well as the chalice having the pattern go on top of it served a very practical purpose because especially in older days, older times, you know, there were spiders on the ceiling or insects and flies. And, and so some of these would fall into the precious blood or onto the host. And even today that happens. So 
And there was actually a mass that I celebrated where I was bitten by a, or stung by a wasp. I won't go into all the details about that right now. But anyways, fruit flies will, fl flies will often come attracted to, to the, the smell of the wine. So this is to protect and to keep safe so that nothing falls in. We could even say so that even when the priest is speaking that his spit doesn't fall onto the chalice or onto the, the altar bread. So traditionally, the priest would only uncover the saboria for the actual consecration. Then they would put the lid back on. And I think maybe going forward, that's the practice that we may have to reintroduce. So sometimes I try to be careful. I try to put all the saboria on this side so that because I'm speaking this way, if there's any you know, little droplets coming out of my mouth when I speak, it wouldn't be falling on to the hosts. So, as I mentioned, traditionally the priest would carry in the chalice for kind of like a weekday mass, not so much a Sunday mass. And the reason for that is that only the priest's hands were allowed to touch the chalice, the paten, as well as the saboria. So nowadays, it's kind of like anyone and everyone could touch it. And part of the problem that I've experienced in my previous parishes, I haven't been using my chalice that often on certain occasions. I have used it. I'd like to use it more often, especially to honor my parents. But as you can see here, my paten, there's these little nicks in it, right? And part of the reason is because it's a very thin metal, as I mentioned, it's a very soft metal. And people who have been preparing my chalices in previous parishes have dropped it many times. So when I had it replated in silver, it was beautiful straight, and now there's like so many nicks in it. I don't know if you could tell, but many, many nicks. And I'm not saying they're being irresponsible. It is something that can happen. So when the priest carries it himself, he's more likely to be careful. I know how to handle it. I'm used to my chalice. Uh, I think in my entire priesthood career, so I was ordained in uh, 1997, how many years is that? Um, 22, I think, or 23 years. I maybe just dropped my patent once, like from a very low level, and it didn't cause any damage, but it had way more, but it was repaired, and once again, these are here. So I'd like to start incorporating using my chalice more often. Maybe when we get back to somewhat normal, I will carry in my chalice for weekday mass and carry it, carry it out also, carry it out also, just so that I can use my chalice more often. The other problem with the silver is that the oil from our hands wears the silver away, and it does the same with gold. So after I use it, I have to polish it to remove all my fingerprints and everything else. And I fear that other people may not do as thorough a job as I do in, in doing that cleaning. But as you can see at the bottom, it's already starting to kind of become uh, less bright, kind of faded. And that's especially so in regards to the bottom. I don't know if you can see. And, and part of the reason is the metal doesn't hold the, the uh, precious uh, silver finish as well as it should. It's not the best metal but it is nevertheless a very nice chalice. And thank you to my parents for, for this chalice. As I mentioned, they are quite expensive, but if somebody were to steal it and to try and melt it down, they're not gonna get much uh, value from it. And usually it's not encouraged to steal it because they're easily identifiable. So don't bother trying to steal it. Anyways, that's my talk for today regarding the um, the chalice and the saboria. I also wanted to mention that, as you know, we we use unleavened bread. So this is a large host, but we do have the smaller ones for the people. I think it would be good to have the companies make bigger sized hosts just to make it easier to give communion in the future going forward, but that's not up to me. I also wanted to mention that in the Eastern Rite, as well as in the Orthodox Church, they don't use unleavened bread the way that we do. So part of the reason we use unleavened bread is because that's what our Lord used at the Last Supper. It's also what the Jewish people took with them into um, when they fled from Egypt, uh, traveling towards the Promised Land, they took unleavened bread. So in the Eastern Rite, they use leavened bread, but they 
When they give communion, it's both the body and blood of Christ. So the bread is soaked in the precious blood, or rather the, the body is soaked in the precious blood, and they use a, a, a small spoon, a very narrow spoon, and you just open your mouth, they put the spoon inside your mouth and turn it so that the, the Eucharist, our Lord, falls into your mouth. And, and I think, yes, there is a greater danger of, of contact there also, but if it's done properly, there's no problem. In regards to intinction, so intinction is when, let's say, you receive the small host and you would dip it into the precious blood and then consume it. So this is a large host, but imagine a small one. So intinction is really not allowed. The problem is when you do that, as you're going to put it into your mouth, the precious blood could be dropping on the ground. So it is possible for a priest to distribute communion by using intention. And there is a special container which we don't have, but it would have a kind of cup in the center of the ciborium that would hold the precious blood. And so the priest would, and the host would be around it. So the priest would take a host, dip it in, and give it in such a fashion that he's moving the ciborium under the person's chin. Or if you recall, traditionally, the altar servers or the altar boys would hold a paten underneath people's chins. And that was just in case the host or a particle of the host might fall. And it does occasionally happen. For some reason, somebody drops a host. So having the paten there was an extra safeguard and it's something that the church actually encourages that we use. It's not just something old or traditional or pre-Vatican II. It's something that the church encourages us to use. So unfortunately, I don't think we have enough patents to be able to use them, but maybe we can look into that in the future. So that's my talk um, regarding uh, preparation for the Mass and just in regards to some of the things that we use for the Mass.